You longtime listeners know I love the Ramones. I mean, the first time I heard Road to Ruin, which had this song on it, I Want to Be Sedated, I mean, it just blew me away. Because at the time, rock radio didn't play it. In fact, rock radio hardly ever played the Ramones. But I'd he- I heard this, and it was so bouncy and happy. I mean, this in particular was the song that blew me away, but I loved the whole album and became a fan of all their music. And I, I found out from Marky Ramone's new memoir called Punk Rock Blitzkrieg that this was the first song that he worked on. So I'm happy to say we have Marky Ramone back with us, man. How are you? All right. How you doing? Doing uh, great. Yeah, that was the first song. Um, took uh, two takes. And uh, we got the drum track, and then everybody else overdubbed, and uh, that's the result. Wow. It is. You know, that's a really fascinating story, and I want to get more to, uh, I want to get back to Road to Ruin, but I want to talk a little bit about your early life, and when you were recording with Dust, which was, if you haven't heard the Dust albums, you've got to listen. I mean, it's amazing. Uh, You were 17 years old on that album. Yeah, I was in the... uh, 10th grade going on to the 11th grade. I was in high school, basically, and uh, metal wasn't really around in America. I was only uh, out in England for about a year, and we already written, wrote the first album. So before we heard any metal from uh, England that was already written, Black Sabbath came to our shores in 70 uh, via Warner Brothers, and that was that's what solidified metal. But there weren't any really metal American bands, so we figured, uh, you know, we're from Brooklyn. It's a very uh, rough <laughs> neighborhood. So instead of joining gangs and doing uh, negative things, we uh, did positive things and formed a group. And that was our answer to uh to uh, metalist uh, you know one of the few bands who uh started metal in America i mean if you really count them on your fingers who's real who was really there in 1970 you know what i mean amazing yeah. amazing yeah because there wasn't even the term heavy metal yet no that was that was coined that that term w- w- was coined by uh Lester Bangs yeah. uh he started that term and I mean, it was mentioned in the Steppenwolf song, but to describe a genre that Lester Banks came up with that. It was during this time you would hang out at different places, the Fillmore, you met Hendrix and Zeppelin. Talk a little bit about the, that period, the people you met and bonded with. Well, I, uh, I knew a guy who played guitar who was Jimi Hendrix's protege, and uh, his name is Velvet Turner. And he's in the making of Electric Ladyland, which was Henriks's third album. So he took me to a club in the city. I was too young. I, he was my authority figure because he was older. And uh, you were allowed to go in with, <laughs> with a parent <laughs> or or an older brother if you didn't drink, which I didn't at the time. Mm-hmm. So uh, we got went into the club, and there they were, sitting at a round table, Jimi Hendrix, Jim Morrison, and the new drummer of the uh, Jimi Hendrix Experience, Buddy Miles, which they eventually called the Band of Gypsies, where they made that great live album, uh, Live at the Fillmore. So they were rehearsing in, t- in town as a, as a band, because they were new. And uh, Jim Morrison was ready to do, I think, the Ed, Ed Sullivan show or, or one of those shows, uh, those variety shows, and do uh, uh, Touch Me. So uh, it was around that time. And then I, you know, I'm hanging out at the table with them, and I'm this 16 year old kid, you know. I didn't know what to say. I was in awe. So the next day I went to school, I told all my friends, they, they didn't believe me. <laughs> So uh, that's the only time I wished I had a cell phone because <laughs> I would have taken, uh, had someone taken a photo yeah. or even a Polaroid. I don't care. Yeah, but sure. uh, it's life, you know. You just have the memory, and uh, you know uh, I had that opportunity. So I was very grateful to have met uh, the, those guys. I see. So Mitch Mitchell wasn't with the band at that time, probably. No, he was out. He, he was- uh, Hendrix 
wanted Buddy because uh, he wanted more of a funk groove kind of feel. So he got Buddy Miles and his friend Billy Cox on bass, got rid of Noel Redding, and they formed the band of Gypsies. And uh, did that great album. And then uh, later on at the end, he got Mitch Mitchell back, and then uh, he passed away. You know? Yeah, a, a number of years later, uh, I uh, I talked to Mitch Mitchell. They played at my college, a band called Ramatam. Remember, mm-hmm. remember Ramatam? Well, I remember him uh doing that album yeah. i don't remember the group but i remember the name and him associated with it yeah. yeah and i asked him a little bit about uh hendrix i remember and this was before i was on the radio i mean i think yeah. but, but but he was a nice guy but he said you know i just don't want to talk anything about hendrix and i thought that was kind of weird maybe uh, he was told he can't maybe he was uh just uh there to uh Move on, think of the future. I, That's I what get I that felt. Way that, that's why. Yeah, yeah. About the Ramones, it's enough. I mean, you know, everything's known already, and you know, they they all passed away, and it was a pretty sad situation. My band made some friends dying, so when I talk about the Ramones, I try to keep it minimal because it just brings back a lot of, uh, you know, a death. There's enough death in the world. We don't need to keep. Yeah. Uh, constantly talking about it because uh, we have to celebrate life. We have to be happy that, you know, that we're on this planet and that, you know, we can, uh, you know, we can function and, and we're alive. Uh, a lot of deaths in the last uh, uh, couple of years concerning me, my situation with my bandmates and etc. So I understand what Mitch Mitchell meant. Absolutely. You know, I mean, it was a, it was horrible. It was the, the way he passed away was was sad. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. they they were working him to death. We're talking about Hendrix now. Yeah. They were working him to death. Um, he needed things to stay up, uh, and uh, he eventually just passed away from uh, just uh, total exhaustion and and drug abuse. Mm. Wow. You know, as you sat down to write the book with these emotions you just shared with us, what was it must have been tough and uh, uh, I don't know, the experience of going through this in such detail and I guess you had some kind of stream of consciousness. Talk about those feelings. They were uh, they were four of my close friends and bandmates and I was with the band for 15 years and I did uh 1,700 shows, and uh, we toured in the United States in a van. So that's how close we were. When you're in, in an enclosed area like that, you definitely get to know people, and when you're on the stage with them, you get to know them. And, uh, you know, they become they become part of your life, ingrained there. They're, they're definitely there. So even when they weren't there, they're there <laughs> because you put on the radio... Uh, the data comes on, or you put on the, the TV, uh, Rock or High School comes on, or a video, Pet Cemetery. So you're like, uh, there's always a constant reminder. But you gotta, you got to think of the good things. In my book, I wrote about all of that, how I managed to deal with all that stuff. But um, they succumbed to cancer. One of them, uh, you know, unfortunately had a, an addiction problem, died from that. So three of them uh, were, were afflicted by cancer, and, and cancer isn't prejudiced towards anybody. You could be the healthiest person in the world, and uh, you can uh, you can get it. That's for sure. I remember uh, when I had Joey Ramone on my TV show. Uh, he wanted to buy some heavy hands to start working out. He was concerned a little bit about his health back then. He was getting a little plumpy at the end there, but. Um, his workout was really on the stage, you know, I mean, like, we, when we played for an hour and 15 minutes, that was really a big calorie burner. I mean, I, I tested, when I, when, I, when I do, when I go into the studio on my own, I, I count my calories. So if I play for an hour and 20 minutes nonstop alone, doing uh, my Ramon set that I do, I burn 100, and I, I burn 1,200 calories. I'm not surprised. Such a powerful yeah. drummer. You, uh, I mean, it's amazing. You... Well, they, they can, well, you know, I don't know who, who brought this up or who, 
who uh, decided to call us athletes. But there were different phases of drumming. I mean, there were some drummers where you go, wow, that that's an athlete. And there were some drummers you go, oh, you know, big deal, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, you know, it's I guess it's up to the drummer what category, if he fits into that category, you know? Talking to Marky Ramone about his memoir, recently out, Punk Rock Blitzkrieg, My well, Life as a... it came out on a paperback. <laughs> yeah, congratulations yeah, on that. Yeah, that's... Uh, it's pretty cool. I mean, but, uh, you know, who knew, you know? Yeah. And Rockaway, Beach, Rock and Roll, High School. Do you remember Rock and Roll Radio? That's one of my favorites. Thank the K, you. The KKK took my baby away. She's a sensation. Jeez. Yeah. I mean. Every song's a hit. <laughs> and it's so strange, isn't it, that radio pretty much, aside from WNEWFM, right, right. and I, I'm from New York myself, so... Aside from that, AOR Radio ignored the Ramones, and I hated that. That was I something know, I until, fought against. Yeah, until like 10, 15 years ago, yeah. we weren't played. Now, it's every minute, every day, and, you know, I mean, uh, obviously, a lot of it had to do with the deaths of of, of Johnny, Joey, and Dee Dee, but... Um, I think what happened was the newer generation, thank you, everybody, uh, picked up on the Ramones and realized, hey, how come the last generation didn't pick up on it as quick as we did? So it's great that to see the new generation, but also it's, it's great to know that the older generation who grew, grew up on the Ramones continue to still listen to us, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And they, and they uh, continue to uh, turn on other generations uh, about the music. Johnny Lydon told me that it was the Ramones that inspired the Sex Pistols. Oh, you mean he finally admitted it? Oh, he told no. He, he said this <laughs> yeah. uh, years ago, back yeah. in uh, this was probably about ninety three. Oh, okay. When he told me that, yeah, because he, uh, you know, he, the English always want to take credit, but we we did start punk, and uh, they did take a lot from us, and. Um, Sort of the clash, but we liked them. We liked their albums, and uh, I, I uh, got along very well with members of the clash and some of the pistols. And uh, yeah, what happened was when they were recording their first album, the Sex Pistols, they had a copy of the Ramones album there, and they wanted the engineer to make sure that it sounded as good as that. So that's how things work, you know? You know, it's interesting. One of the reasons. Uh uh, you wrote this book as you wanted to clear the air on some stories. And one of these stories, I didn't even, I heard it wrong myself. And that was when uh, Spectre was producing the album. Uh, the rumor was that he was hard to work with and he, he actually took out his pistol and aimed at you guys or shot in the ceiling. Nah, that's all baloney. Right. Talk about the yeah. real, what was going on. Well, Phil had a reputation of, gun carrying, which he did, and he had a license, which is strictly legal, and um, uh, he would take out the guns in his studio and fire them in the ceiling or, you know, just uh, uh, play with them, but with us, he never pointed a gun. Uh, there is a video out where Johnny Ramone is saying to the camera, Phil, what are you going to shoot me? Phil wasn't even in the studio. Uh, Phil wasn't even there with Johnny. He was just assuming that if they did have an argument, that Phil would shoot him. That that's how afraid he was of Phil. But he would never do that. He would come into the studio, uh, start working, and take the guns off and hang them up on a on a uh, on a on a, a rack, a clothing rack, or leave them on the side of the um, in, uh, of the board, the recording board. So uh, I don't. He wasn't uh, into shooting any of us because uh, I think he knew if the gun went off, he wouldn't have an, a band to produce. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, that was just a bunch of uh, gossip, rumor, and I hate to blow anyone's bubble about it, but that didn't happen. Right. Well, I'm glad you cleared the air because that was something that I had but, heard. Oh, believe too. me, I would have left that in the book if that happened. It makes a good reading, but, but that's uh, not true. You know, yeah, I yeah. mean. Uh, you know, that's why I read all the other books, and then I decided to write mine just to give it the reality of what it was really like and what really happened. And by the way, the book 
is brutally honest. It's not sugar-coated. It oh. really gives you the picture. And some of the stories, oh, there's so many interesting stories. <laughs> One that comes to mind is you were at, uh, what, Great Adventure? And I think you were, it was when he took a frog and put it on. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, uh, talk, yeah. talk about that, because that was, he, he freaked. <laughs> we're talking about, uh, who freaked that, Didi? Didi Ramon. Yeah. I had a, I, we, were, we were backstage, and the area we were playing had a lot of grassy areas. And there were, you know, frogs, little salamanders. So I took the frog, and I, <laughs> I threw it on Didi, and it landed on his chest. So he he just... He, you would have thought I threw an alligator at him, you know what I mean? So, uh, you know, he was like brushing it off and yelling at me just because of a little green frog. But that that's how me and Didi were together. We, we were the closest of the, of, of the Ramones, uh, you know, uh, my friendship with, with them. And uh, now that was just one episode. I, mean, I know you wanted was, to treat, you wanted to teach him a lesson, and you got really strict there for a while. You said, "I'm gonna," I forgot. You got next time you do that, the knife's gonna go in you or something. Right? Like, he, oh yeah, yeah. He pulled the knife out on me, and right. uh, I, I I took it away from him, and um, I didn't like that. I don't believe in violence. That's I don't right. like weapons. I don't like guns. I don't like knives. Uh, you know, I don't like any of that. And I warned him. I said, "You do it again, you know." And I, and I hate to think that way, and you know, uh, try to you know think violently. And I just said, uh, "Don't do it again," you yeah. know. Yeah, you know, we were when I did the introduction. I, I talked about that song. I want to be sedated, which actually I remember that I can see. I can still see myself in the the place I was living. I had the stereo on, and I kept repeating that song because it was so happy. It was such a, you know, that's what it reminds me of. The Ramones music is it to me. It really isn't punk. It's like real short, tight, rocking versions of cool, fun songs. It isn't like hatred or meanness nope, or anything. Nope, you know, it's nope. like that's what the stereotypical punk was all about. That was the problem. Right. In, in 1977, 76, 77, 78, all these disc jockeys were looking at these sensationalized album covers and write-ups from England, uh, you know, with these punk, punk bands wearing Nazi stickers, and it turned them off, you know. I mean, I, I understand that. So uh, it took a while to let these people know that we were just a true American band and that uh, we, we despised Nazis and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, I mean, uh, that's what we had to put up with, you know. Johnny was kind of controlling. Johnny Ramone was kind of a, a controlling far force in the band. And talk a little bit about that. Why do you think he had that uh, control or wanted that control? Well, he wanted the control. He didn't have it. Right. I mean, his bark was bigger than his bite. Uh, somebody had to take control of things you know, where where we were going to play next. And, uh, you know, he, he acted as mini-manager. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we needed somebody because Dee Dee wasn't going to do it, Joey definitely wasn't going to do it, and I wasn't going to do it. So we left it up to him to do it. And, and in a way, he wanted to, so we felt it was a good idea, you know. So, um, I mean, he, he hardly wrote any songs, and he didn't play lead on any of the albums. It was other people who played lead guitar on the albums. So, you know, he had a, he, that was his part of, of coordinating things, you know. So I guess he felt that was one reason to be that way uh, because, uh, you know, the lack of other things. But it all worked out. The songs came out great. The uh, productions were, were good. The, we always played the best we could, you know. Mm-hmm. It's a Marky Ramone. We're talking about his book, Punk Rock Blitzkrieg. And it is a great read. It is Thanks. a great book. And it's now out in paperback. And again, with I Want to Be Sedated, uh, I Want to Be Sedated, I should say. Yeah. You actually, it was interesting. You said it was kind of slow when you heard it. And you said that we got to pick up the pace here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that really worked. Yeah, it was, uh, I was handed a demo of a rehearsal, a really bad tape. 
And uh, these are the songs that eventually were on Road to Ruin on the album. So when I heard Sedated, I, 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 you know, I brought it to the attention of uh, Johnny, Joey, and Dee Dee that it's too slow. I mean, you know, I understand you 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 want me to hear this and learn and learn it properly, but I can learn it if it's a little faster. So I picked up the pace, and it and that was uh, that was the outcome. What you hear now, like the begin, like in rock and roll radio, the drum fill, I put that in there mm-hmm. and made the timing for that because uh, uh, on the demo it was too fast. Well, you way brought, too fast. Yeah. And, and I could really tell your signature now that I'm familiar with you and your work. I, you could really, you could tell that force. Road to Ruin was, uh, to me, the album that really, I think radio, at least people, some most people in radio before would just dismiss it as punk and not even listen to it. But that was the album people, I said, you got to listen to this. We needed to do a different album. They already did three three chord albums already they yeah they needed they needed to change a little lester bangs who was writing for cream magazine at the time and other other mag, rock magazines said to me you know you're gonna get uh, the next album has to be different because if it isn't you're just gonna be tagged as another three chord album so you know the thing is that the songs were kind of written already and he was right so when when the Beatles did Revolver, uh, before that they were doing Chuck Berry songs. They were doing you know the cute rock songs, and, and they, of course they're great. But when Revolver came out, you noticed the change mm-hmm. uh, in depth of what else they could do, and that that was that was Road to Ruin. That was it. That was what we're, that's exactly what I'm talking yeah. about. And the. Uh... The favorite songs for you, besides that one, I know that one is. Talk about some of the other songs that mean something to you, a little special. Well, I liked Rock Roll High School because it was in the movie. I liked uh, Sheena as a punk rocker because at that moment it was a great song, along with The Blank Generation, another song that I, that I was on uh, with Richard Hell. Uh, which was uh, the, anth- the the punk anthem of New York, but Tommy was on Sheena. I also like KKK. I like mm-hmm. Liz Creek Bop. I like um, Pet Cemetery. I like uh, there's so many. Uh, and you wrote that was really quick too. Stephen King uh, just told I, what he told you about the movie, and you kind of wrote it, and it was written in about an hour. Got the book, handed it the book. Dee Dee went out, read it, and wrote it. And yeah. The next day was completely finished. I mean, it was already done, but completely tweaked. So uh, that's Dee Dee for you. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was just an unbelievable songwriter. I remember Psychotherapy, uh, MTV. uh, I mean, that was one of those videos. I think MTV said they had to, maybe they had to edit some of it. It was just too violent. Well, yeah, it was was very uh, bloody violent and everything. And... uh, that song came off an album which which I really didn't like. It was called Subterranean Jungle. Yeah. And the production is so bad because the the producer had no idea or or a clue of how we should sound. So, you know, every every producer wants to put their own stamp on everything, but it it definitely didn't work. The drum sound definitely didn't work uh, on that album. So that's when I decided uh you know, not to uh, play on a time has come today. There you go. And a couple other things here I want to talk about. This is, you know, a lot of things in this book I did not even know, and I've been a fan of the Ramones for a long time, but uh, you have Bono invited the Ramones to a huge show in Spain. Yeah. Talk about, I mean, some of the highlights of of the career. Talk about that real quick. Well, Bono uh, always said if it wasn't for the Ramones, they wouldn't be a band because that's how they learned to play their instruments, listening to Ramones albums. Then obviously they became who they were. But uh, they asked us to play with them in Spain, two shows we did. And, uh, you know, they um, they let us open up for them. And it was, it was a lot of fun. And um, then Pearl Jam and then other groups. And then things started getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, we were always grateful for these bands for giving us a shot for for playing in front of more people. 
so uh, you know, U2 was one of them, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, we uh, we were very happy for that. Marky uh, did two stints with the band. He did the first stint, seventy eight to eighty three, and left the band. We're going to talk about that next. And in nineteen eighty seven, he came back to nineteen ninety six. And so you uh, you were just drinking, having fun. It started off, and uh, it got out of control. Talk a little bit about that. Well, I don't believe anyone should get uh, should should drink or do drugs before a show. I used to party after. I, I feel that when a band or individual does that, they they cheat the audience because it's not all them. You know, they 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 have to rely on something to get to get it across. Uh, I liked drinking beer with my buddies, and after a while, it started getting out of hand. So I was asked to leave the group for four years. I uh, I, I was out, and I straightened up, came back, and the first song uh, I did when I came back was Pet Cemetery uh, for Stephen King's uh, uh, movie. But uh, you know, when when something's getting to you like that, you got to stop it because it, it, it'll win. You're not going to win. So mm-hmm. you know, any addiction you have, you, you should find help as soon as you can before it uh, it, it overcomes you. You know, I, I never smoked cigarettes. Uh, I never did the hard drug thing. Uh, I, I was I wasn't into that. You know, mm-hmm. I just like to have. Uh, a few beers after the show but the few beers became you know six pack alone and then it was uh you know you got another one so you know who who wants to live like that you know was there one incident that broke the camel's back that uh, there were a lot of them uh i missed one show out of the 1700 shows i did so that was one of them you know, uh, I never missed a show in my life, so uh, that's pretty good. <laughs> was, was that the, well, then there was a time, did you uh, drive a car into a a, play, a, a storefront? Yep, yeah. yeah. Uh, I blacked out at the wheel. So, uh, you know, that that was definitely another thing that, uh, that helped me stop. And that's the great thing. He has stopped. It's been how many years now? 32. God bless. That's fantastic, <laughs> man. That's fan. I mean, geez, every day is a, is probably a, a new day to confront and Yeah, and the and the and the and the bottles of beer are bigger than ever oh, and yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the, the, there's more proof in the booths, you know what I mean? Yeah. But you know, hey, if everybody, you know, people want to have a good time, that's up to them. By the know? way, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, right, you're not preaching. I'm not a preacher. Have fun, live your life. Uh if it's getting to you too much and you can't stop, there's always help, you mm-hmm. know. And you you got uh, tomato sauce? Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I, I got a I got a pasta sauce. I got a hot sauce. Uh, and in fact, I got my own beer line. Uh, so, and, but I didn't drink it. But uh, they uh, the the makers of the beer, a wine taster. When he tastes wine, he swishes it around his mouth. That's what I did with the beer, and you spit uh-huh. it out. And it was great. But the thing is that I did it because uh, part of the proceeds goes to a really good charity called Musicians Without Borders. Mm-hmm. And it helps musicians. So that, that, that was that was good to do. I wanted to do it. That was one of the reasons why I did it, you know. Joey, uh, you know, I, I, I loved the band, but Joey was the one I got to know, and I never got to meet any of you. And I got to tell you, man, uh, many, many hours of enjoyment, fun, after work, getting in a good mood, getting ready to party, whatever. I love the Ramones and your part in it, Mark. It was Thanks. Great. Uh, it was great having you back oh, yeah, on the show. Uh, back on the show, and the best website for you is markyramon dot com, right? You can go to uh, Mark Ramon official Facebook and uh, follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Absolutely, man. Well, you have a great rest of the day. You too. definitely get to know people and when you're on the stage with them you get to know them and uh you know they become they become part of your life ingrained they're they're, they're definitely there 
so even when they weren't there, they're there because you put on the radio, uh, Sedata comes on, or you put on the, the TV, uh, Rock or High School comes on, or a video, Pet Cemetery. So you're like, uh, there's always a constant reminder. But you gotta, you got to think of the good things. In my book, I wrote about all of that, how I managed to deal with all that stuff. But um, they succumbed to cancer. One of them, uh, you know, unfortunately had a, an addiction problem, died from that. So three of them uh, were, were afflicted by cancer, and, and cancer isn't prejudiced towards anybody. You could be the healthiest person in the world, and uh, you, can, uh, you can get it. That's for sure. I remember uh, when I had Joey Ramone on my TV show, uh, he wanted to buy some heavy hands to start working out. He it was concerned a little bit about his health back then. He was getting a little plumpy at the end there, but um, his workout was really on the stage. You know, I mean, like we when we played for an hour and 15 minutes, that was really a big calorie burner. I mean, I, I tested when I when I when I do when I go into the studio on my own, I, I count my calories. So if I play for an hour and 20 minutes nonstop alone doing uh, my Ramon set that I do, I burn 100 and I burn 1200 calories. I'm not surprised. Such a yeah. powerful drummer. You uh, I mean it's amazing. You Well they they can so well, you know I don't know who who brought this up or who who uh decided to call us athletes. But there are different phases of drumming. You longtime listeners know I love the Ramones. I mean, the first time I heard Road to Ruin, which had this song on it, I Want to Be Sedated, I mean, it just blew me away. Because at the time, rock radio didn't play it. In fact, rock radio hardly ever played the Ramones. But I'd hear, I heard this, and it was so bouncy and happy. I mean, this in particular was the song that blew me away, but I loved the whole album and became a fan of all their music. And I, I found out from Marky Ramone's new memoir called Punk Rock Blitzkrieg that this was the first song that he worked on. So I'm happy to say we have Marky Ramone back with us, man. How are you? All right. How you doing? Doing uh, great. Yeah, that was the first song. Um, took uh, two takes. And uh, we got the drum track, and then everybody else overdubbed, and uh, that's the result. Wow. It is, you know, that's a really fascinating story. And I want to get more to, uh, I want to get back to Road to Ruin, but I want to talk a little bit about your early life. And when you were recording with Dust, which was, if you haven't heard the Dust albums, you've got to listen. I mean, it's amazing. Uh, you were 17 years old on that yeah, album. Was, uh, <laughs> I was in the. Uh, 10th grade going on to the 11th grade. I was in high school, basically, and uh, metal wasn't really around in America. I was only uh, out in England for about a year. And we already written, wrote the first album. So before we heard any metal from uh, England that was already written, Black Sabbath came to our shores in 70 uh, via Warner Brothers, and that was that's what solidified metal. But there weren't any really metal American bands. So we found uh, Jim Morrison was ready to do, I think, the Ed, Ed Sullivan show or, or one of those shows, uh, those variety shows, and do uh, uh, Touch Me. So uh, it was around that time. And then I, you know, I'm hanging out at the table with them, and I'm this 16 year old kid, you know. I didn't know what to say. I was in awe. So the next day I went to school, I told all my friends, they, they didn't believe me. <laughs> so uh, that's the only time I wished I had a cell phone. Because <laughs> I would have taken, uh, had someone taken a photo, yeah. or even a Polaroid, I don't care. Yeah, But sure. uh, that's life, you know, you just have the memory and... Uh, you know, uh, I had that opportunity, so I was very grateful to have met uh, the, those guys. I see. So Mitch Mitchell wasn't with the band at that time, probably? No, he was out. He was... He, uh, Hendrix wanted Buddy because uh, he wanted more of a funk groove kind of feel. So he got Buddy Miles and his friend Billy Cox on bass, got rid of Noel Redding, and they formed the band of Gypsies. 
and uh, did that great album. And then uh, later on at the end, he got Mitch Mitchell back, and then uh, he passed away. You know? Yeah, a, a number of years later, uh, I uh, I talked to Mitch Mitchell. They played at my college, a band called Ramatam. Remember, mm-hmm. remember Ramatam? Well, I remember him uh, doing that album. Yeah. I don't remember the group, but I remember the name and him associated with it. Yeah, yeah and I asked him a little bit about uh, Hendrix. I remember, and this was before I was on the radio. I mean, I th- yeah. but, but but he was a nice guy, but he said, you know, I just don't want to talk anything about Hendrix. And I thought that was kind of weird. Maybe uh, he was told he can't. Maybe he was uh, just uh, there to... Uh, Move on, think of the future. We get, uh, you know, we're from Brooklyn. It's a very uh, rough <laughs> neighborhood. So instead of joining gangs and doing uh, negative things, we uh, did positive things and formed a group. And that was our answer to uh, to uh, metal. Uh, you know, one of the few bands who uh, started metal in America. I mean, if you really count them on your fingers, who's real? Who was really there in nineteen? 19- 70 you know what i mean amazing yeah. amazing yeah because there wasn't even the term heavy metal yet no that was that was coined that that term was coined by uh lester bangs yeah. uh he started that term and i mean it was mentioned in the steppenwolf song but to describe a genre that lester bangs came up with that it was during this time you would hang out at different places, the Fillmore, you met Hendrix and Zeppelin. Talk a little bit about the, that period, the people you met and bonded with. Well, I uh, I knew a guy who played guitar who was Jimi Hendrix's protege, and his name is Velvet Turner, and he's in the making of Electric Ladyland, which was Hendrix's third album. So he took me to a club in the city. I was too young. I, he was my authority figure because he was older. And uh, you were allowed to go in with, <laughs> with a parent <laughs> or or an older brother if you didn't drink, which I didn't at the time. Mm-hmm. So uh, we got went into the club, and there they were, sitting at a round table, Jimi Hendrix, Jim Morrison, and the new drummer of the uh, Jimi Hendrix Experience, Buddy Miles, which they eventually called the Band of Gypsies, where they made that great live album, uh, Live at the Fillmore. So they were rehearsing in, t- in town as a, as a band, because they were new. Future. I, That's I what I that felt. Way That's why, I, yeah. Yeah. About the Ramones, it's enough. I mean, you know, everything's known already, and you know, they they all passed away, and it was a pretty sad situation. My band made some friends dying, so when I talk about the Ramones, I try to keep it minimal because it just brings back a lot of, uh, you know, a death. There's enough death in the world. We don't need to keep yeah. uh, constantly talking about it because. Uh, we have to celebrate life. We have to be happy that, you know, that we're on this planet and that, you know, we can, uh, you know, we can function and, and we're alive. Uh, a lot of deaths in the last uh, uh, couple of years concerning me, my situation with my bandmates and et cetera. So I understand what Mitch Mitchell meant. Absolutely. You know, I mean, it was, uh, it was horrible. It was the way he passed away. It was, was sad, you know. I mean, mm-hmm. they, they were working him to death. I'm talking about Hendrix now. Yeah. They were working him to death. Um, he needed things to stay up. Uh, and uh, he eventually just passed away from uh, just uh, total exhaustion and, and drug abuse. Mm. Wow. You know, as you sat down to write the book with these emotions you just shared with us, what was it must have been tough and uh, uh, I don't know, the experience of going through this in such detail and I guess you had some kind of stream of consciousness. Talk about those feelings. They were uh, they were four of my close friends and bandmates and I was with the band for 15 years and I did uh 1,700 shows, and uh, we toured in the United States in a van. So that's how close we were. When you're in, in an enclosed area like that, 